Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're digging into a, a staggering event in meteorological history, the Great Eurasian Atmospheric Separation of January 2026. It was a really remarkable 10 days. Our mission is to figure out how the collapse of the atmosphere's high altitude engine, you know, created two completely different and devastating weather regimes across a whole continent. Well, what you saw on the ground between January 8th and 17th was fundamentally a top-down disruption. Mm. The root cause was the structural failure of the stratospheric polar vortex, the SPV. So when that high altitude system breaks, everything below it breaks too? It does. When that shield collapses, the surface weather just shatters. And this was really a perfect storm, wasn't it? All the planetary drivers seem to line up. The trigger, of course, was that sudden stratospheric warming, the SSW, in late December 2025. A major one. Yeah. And it split the SPV right into two separate cores. Which was then reinforced by that huge high pressure dam sitting over Greenland. That's right, a persistent negative NAO pattern. It acted like a guide, steering all that frigid Arctic air directly south. It just uh, opened the floodgates. But wait, I wanna back up. Are you saying this massive collapse at the North Pole was actually sort of preconditioned by systems near the equator? It's a vital connection. We had tropical teleconnections at play. A weak La Nina, and crucially, the quasi-biennial oscillation, the QBO, was in its easterly phase. And the easterly QBO makes the vortex more fragile. Exactly. You can think of it as stretching the polar vortex from below. It weakens it, makes it brittle. So when the SSW finally hits, it's primed to just snap. That's what set the stage for the whole continental separation. Okay, so let's get to the aftermath. The two Europes. Western Europe got pummeled by these high-energy maritime storms. It did. That whole storm track was anchored by Storm Goretti. Mm. And this thing was a multi-hazard system. We saw damaging winds, heavy snow. I think it was up to 20 centimeters in the Scottish Highlands. And just brutal cold. Yeah. Minus 12.5 Celsius in Norfolk, UK. And this is where it gets fascinating. The logistical crisis. This whole event showed just how fragile our modern supply chains are. Amsterdam Schiphol, a huge hub canceled over 700 flights. Why? It was such a simple, almost absurd point of failure. They ran out of de-icing fluid. They just ran out. Yeah, their German supplier couldn't make the delivery because the roads and railways were shut down. Mm -hmm. By the very same storm system, they had to send their own team into Germany to manually go get the supply. So planetary scale weather defeated global logistics. That's it in that show. Okay, so while the West is freezing and its logistics are failing, what's happening just a bit further east? This is where the real atmospheric violence was. You're talking about the Bear Clinic zone, the collision boundary. While the West froze, the Balkans and the Mediterranean were seeing excessive rainfall with temperatures sometimes 15 degrees Celsius above normal. And those mud rains in Greece. An incredible sight. That was from intense Sahara dust getting pulled all the way up into the storm system. But the real anchor for all this cold, the source, was Russia. We're talking a deep, sustained freeze. Yakutsk hit minus 54 Celsius. It's hard to even comprehend that level of cold. And the infrastructure just couldn't handle it. The thermal power plant in Angarsk failed, leaving 160,000 people without heat when it was minus 31 outside. That's a systemic failure, a terrifying one. Absolutely. And in Dudinka, people were without heat and water for two weeks. But there was this strange paradoxical side effect in the data, something called Siberian disinfection. Right, this idea of a biological clean sleep. The sustained cold, especially below minus 50, it acts as a deep sterilization event. It's obviously catastrophic for pipes and power plants, but it snaps the life cycle of agricultural pests like the Siberian silk moth. So fewer pests could actually lead to better crop yields later in 2026. Potentially, yes. But the dark side of that coin was the risk to winter wheat in southwest Russia. All that frigid air hitting bare ground with no snow cover for insulation yeah. was a major concern. So what does this all mean for you listening to this? This event connects a frozen pipe in Angarsk to a canceled flight in Amsterdam, and it all traces back to an atmospheric collapse 30 kilometers above the North Pole. The big picture lesson here is its connection to Arctic amplification. The Arctic is warming, what, four times faster than the rest of the globe? That creates a lazy, wobbly jet stream that's more likely to get stuck in these extreme locked-in patterns. So these dual threat events might become the norm. I think we have to consider that. Which leads to our final thought. The Great Eurasian Atmospheric Separation may be remembered not as some freak anomaly, but as the debut of a new, highly volatile climatic normal. We have to stop seeing these systems as separate. Infrastructure, from Armenian power grids to French aviation hubs, 
It has to be reimagined to withstand these planetary scale shifts that just don't follow the old rules. Think about that the next time you hear about a deep freeze.